Financial Times this week. It was an opinion piece by Tony Blair. And in his normal, modest way, he explained how if he was in charge of solving the problems in Greece, they could all be swept away in no time at all. But in passing in that article, he said if the economy in Britain had shrunk by 25%, then the result would be revolution. Now, as Peter said in the last session, Britain has not suffered, of course, on the scale that Greece has, but nonetheless, it was only in the middle of last year that the UK economy surpassed the size before it was before the crisis hit. And output remains not 25% below what it was in 2008, but still a massive 16% below the pre-crisis trend. I don't want to give loads of statistics. Comrades know them. But wages have fallen by more than at any time in the last 100 years. The cumulative fall in real earnings it, since 2008 is now over 9%. More than a quarter of children live in, with severe material deprivation. The number of people admitted to hospital with malnutrition, mostly a result of the benefit cuts, has doubled in the course of the last five years. And while not immediately or in the short term, it's nonetheless true that the brutal reality of 21st century capitalism in Britain will have, over a period of time, revolutionary consequences. Of course, at this stage, it seems that there is still an all-pervasive calm on the surface of society. But that conceals, as we say in the perspectives document, a growing ferment below. And that is understood actually by big sections of the capitalist class. They don't know what to do about inequality. They're not about to give up anything themselves, but they are worried about the consequences of it. They know that it's not sustainable to have a world, as we will soon have, where the richest 1% have more wealth than the other 99%. I don't know how many comrades read the article in the mirror, which described how there were discussions at the Davos summit about how a big number of financiers, head funds managers and so on, their solution to the problems of inequality is to prepare to run away. And that they're all buying big mansions in remote part of New Zealand and other places without much of a population with their own airstrips with the idea that when the population in the cities rise up and overthrow them, then they'll have somewhere to run away to where they can live in safety. But of course, the question in many comrades' minds is still, how is it that they've been able to get away without having to resort to those airstrips so far, at least as far as Britain is concerned? How have they been able to get away with it so far? The primary reason is the absence of any means by which the majority can see to effectively fight back. As we've discussed repeatedly in these conferences, whenever a lead has been given, workers, including in Britain, have shown their preparedness to fight. As we all know, the high point in the first round of the battle against austerity in Britain was the movement against pensions, in, or against the attacks on pensions, in 2011. And at that stage, the idea of a one-day general strike against austerity in Britain had huge popular support. Over 80% of the population supported such a general strike in repeated opinion polls. Also at that time, UKIP tried to organise a demonstration in favour of austerity and were able to mobilise no more than two or 300 people in favour of cuts at that point in time. The weakness of the government at that stage was extremely clear. And we have to remember, as the myth of this being a strong government is created, only 24% of the electorate voted for the Tory party. They couldn't get anywhere near a majority government. And they were, ex they were extremely weak. And at that point in time, the defeat of the government was posed. It was the derailing of that movement by the right-wing trade union leaders which has allowed this government to get away with implementing five years of vicious austerity. And of course, in the wake of that betrayal, 
we have seen a relative lull in the struggle. But even in this pre-election period, we can actually see the beginnings of a new stage of a struggle against austerity in Britain. We've seen in the private sector a number of important struggles over pay. In particular, the London bus workers strike. More than 20,000 bus workers striking to equalise pay upwards and to all get the best rate for the job. Now, Peter made the point in the last discussion that if we were facing an economic recovery, there would be big advantages to that because it would give workers confidence to struggle. We're not facing, in any real sense, an economic recovery, but there's no question in that strike and in other strikes like those of the JCB workers and others, there is, uh, the Jaguar workers and so on, there is an element that the propaganda of recovery jars so sharply with workers' own experience of continued austerity that, if you like, it is giving them a certain confidence to fight back and to say, we want a real end to austerity, we want to take back a little bit of what we are owed. That is clearly a factor in the private sector, but it is also an element in the coordinated strike action that has taken place in the public sector. Let's remember, at last year's National Congress, we were warning the party that it could be the case there would be no further coordinated strike action until beyond the general election, as the union leaders said, let's just wait for Labour, they're going to solve our problems. But that proved to be too pessimistic, because very quickly afterwards, it became clear that it's just not viable for the trade union leaders to say, wait for Labour, they're going to solve your problems. Nobody will believe that. And therefore, they've been forced to call a series of coordinated strikes over pay. Now, as we know, that action, first in local government and then in health, has been called off by the right-wing union leaders in return for very little gains indeed. But it's an indication of the mood that exists below what has taken place in response to that action being called off. In local government in particular, it's only the second time in the history of Unison that the branches have been able to force the national leadership to call a recall conference, or the, the branches have been able to trigger a recall conference in order to discuss that betrayal. And just, I think, this last, or the last couple of weeks, and the service group executive of Unison, so the leadership of local government in Unison, then we were able, the left were able, to win votes attacking the leadership with a whole section of the right splitting away and voting with the left, such was the anger that exists from below. And that gives you a little hint beyond the general election of what can take place even in the most right-wing unions as a result of the anger and the mood that exists that it's necessary to have a serious struggle against austerity and on pay. Of course, we also recognise that where workers are blocked industrially, at a certain point they will find other ways to express their anger. And that really is what took place in Scotland where they found an independence referendum. And Matt is here from Scotland and I'm sure will speak in the discussion. We've made this point lots of times, but it's necessary just to repeat here. The independence referendum answered once and for all the idea that workers in Britain are apathetic, that they're not interested in politics. This was the highest turnout since the introduction of universal suffrage and the majority of workers who voted in that referendum saw clearly that voting yes was a means to oppose austerity. And as we know, since then, the parties that campaigned for yes, in the first instance, primarily the SNP, have had, they have been flooded with new members who want to continue that struggle. In a way, and this is, we've discussed it in the last session, the that what's taken place in Ireland is a similar break in the situation. There is a comparison here as well that the blockage by the right-wing trade union leaders in Ireland was pushed aside when workers rose from below and fought back on the question of austerity. Let's remember, the Irish press regularly described the Irish population as sheeple because they were meant to be as, as passive as sheep and now they decry them as the mob as a result of the mass movement that is developing. 
Now, here in England and Wales, we have not yet had, the working class have not found an effective means to fight back in the way they did in the independence referendum or the way they are in the water charges in Ireland. That's true on a national basis. It doesn't mean there aren't some local developments. The movement on the question of housing in London, the demonstration that took place a couple of uh, weeks ago as an important straw in the wind of the kind of movements that can develop on that issue in the future. But what we can say nationally is while it has not yet found an expression, the mood in England and Wales is fundamentally no different to the mood in Ireland or in Scotland. And even now, in a distorted way, that mood is being reflected in the political process. Of course, the absence of a mass workers' party, the absence of any sizable left party at this uh, point, mass left party at this point in time, is a central factor in the political situation. But the absence of, that, of such a party does not prevent the fracturing of the old established parties as a result of the crisis of capitalism. For a long time, we have described the Americanization of British politics. The fact that the, socialist, the social base of the big parties has been progressively undermined over decades now. Their membership shrinking, greater abstentionism, in particular, the link between workers who traditionally saw Labour as their party and Labour being broken. Between 1997 and 2010, Labour lost 5 million votes, which they've not been able to regain. The Tories in this election know full well that they're not going to be able to reach beyond their kind of core base in most cases. The majority of the population see the Tories as only representing the rich, so they have an accurate assessment of what the Tory party is. Two-thirds of people thought that Osborne's autumn spending review statement was wrong and extreme. So the Tories' election strategy really is to mobilise their key base. Even their election bribes are mainly aimed at the old, the rich, because they're the people who might be bribed to go out and to vote for the Tory party. So in that situation, it's just incredible that they're not guaranteed to go down to defeat at the general election. So it's 13 years now since, 40, since, uh, since any party got 40% of the votes, and it seems extremely unlikely that Labour or any party, certainly no other party, but it's very unlikely that Labour will manage to pull that off in this election. Why is that? We can all see the inadequacies of Miliband as a leader of the Labour Party, but it would be very shallow to imagine that that is the reason that Labour are not going to succeed, or very, very unlikely to succeed, in winning uh, a, a serious majority in the coming general election. It's obvious to us. It's the endless mantra of Me Tooism. Whenever the Tories put forward some new element of austerity, Labour's response is to say, we would do no different. I'm not going to give all of the examples. All of you know the examples. But probably one of the clearest was when Osborne put the vote to Parliament over the question of another £30 billion worth of cuts in the next Parliament, and only five Labour MPs voted against it. I mean, what more reason do you need for it to be clear that Labour will struggle in this general election? Now, having said that, looking today, and it can still change before the election, it is probably still more likely that Labour will come out of the biggest uh, out of the election, if not with a majority, as the biggest party from the general election. If they do that, it will be because with their attacks on HSBC tax dodgers, with their statements on the National Health Service, they managed to sound at least a little bit more in favour of ordinary people and less completely pro-rich than is uh, the case with the Tory party. There was an article by the city editor of the Evening Standard a couple of days ago in the Evening Standard, which was talking about how uh, big business are hysterical about the prospect of a Miliband government. And they, use, they make the same point that we make in the perspectives document, where he says it's no longer possible, it's unthinkable, for Labour to talk, as Mandelson once did, 
about being intensely relaxed, about people getting filthy rich. But he goes on to say, instead of the filthy rich complaining about this, perhaps they should think about why it is. Miliband sniffs on the wind the recession-induced shift of public opinion against large corporations and their bosses. And in a world where pay and pensions are st stagnant, everywhere but in the boardroom, he might have a point. And that's the issue. When the right-wing press get hysterical about red ed, it's laughable. It's a completely Blairite programme that the Labour leadership are putting forward. But what it reflects is not Labour's policies, but the fear of the mood that exists in society and how the appetite for social change can grow. Out of Miliband's pathetic statements against the HSBC, tax dodgers, demands for real workers' nationalisation of the banks under working class control can begin to gain an echo. And that is what they are terrified of. But of course, nobody is more scared of that than the Labour leadership themselves. Hence them spending such an enormous amount of energy. Every time they say something slightly popular, undoing it and emphasising how they too are in favour of austerity. And that leaves a huge space open, which currently the SNP, the Greens to some extent, are managing to step into by claiming to be anti-austerity. So what does it mean for the result of the general election? This general election will represent a tipping point in the process of the undermining of the establishment parties. It seems at this stage most likely that Labour and the Tories combined will get less than 65% of the votes cast in the general election. The latest predictions suggest that there will be 100 or more MPs who are not Tory or Labour for the first time in more than 90 years. Now, by the way, even if that doesn't quite happen this time, even if at the last minute workers grit their teeth and think, OK, we will go and vote Labour because we want to stop the Tories, in other words, the kind of traditional loyalties still play out to a greater extent than currently seems most likely, that won't alter the process. The process towards the fracturing and breakup of the established mainstream parties will continue and be unstoppable beyond the general election, really regardless of the outcome on the 8th of May. Now, there are a number of consequences that we need to discuss from this process. One is the question of the electoral system and will there be a change from the current first-past-the-post system towards some kind of proportional representation. As the established parties fracture and you have not two or three but five, six, seven, eight main parties, first-past-the-post can become just blatantly completely undemocratic. However, in our view, the capitalist class also recognise if they move away from first past the post to some form of PR, that will accelerate the process of the breakup of the establishment parties and increase instability from their point of view. And therefore, they will cling to first past the post as long as possible. Equally, therefore, we have to campaign for a change in the electoral system and for some form of PR which would have advantages for ourselves and for a new mass party of the working class. But while we do that, we shouldn't give an impression that we can't do anything under this electoral system. Let's remember, on the basis of mass struggle, the Labour Party was forged and gained a mass base under a first-past-the-post system. Sharma's election result in the US was on the basis of first-past-the-post. So we can make breakthroughs. We may not make breakthroughs in this election, but we can make breakthroughs under this system uh, under this system at the same time as we should campaign for a change in the ele electoral uh, system. Now, other consequences of what is taking place. The idea put forward by the leaders of the major trade unions that there's no choice but to support Labour because Labour is the only show in town. That drumbeat is growing in the run-up to the general election and it will continue to do so. But actually, objectively, beyond the general election, it's becoming ridiculous. As you see, the SNP make gains, the Greens make gains, UKIP make gains. It becomes clear it's not a question of Labour or nothing. It's a question that Labour is disintegrating and other forces will grow out of that 
And are you going to allow that to be the right-wing populace of UKIP, or are we going to build a new force that actually stands in the interests of the working class? The ideas that we've put forward over decades, that we need a mass party of the working class in Britain, that is becoming so obvious that even people who have resisted it with every fibre of their being are now being forced to recognise that that is the direction things are going in. We have fought hard now to develop the trade unionist and socialist coalition over five years. We are going to take our biggest stand so far in the general election coming up in a few weeks' time. But we have never been wedded to Tusk for its own sake. We've always seen it as a lever to fight for the establishment of a new mass party of the working class. We're never going to say, if it's not called Tusk, we don't like it. I mean, you know, let's face it, Tusk is not the snappiest name in the world. Um, uh, and if we saw the development of a sizable, working class based, democratic, with a federal element to allow the unions to be involved on a federal basis, party, which had a fighting programme and room within it for us to argue for it to have a clear socialist programme, we would welcome that as a big step forward. Having said that, if you look at how the People's Assembly operates, it's complete lack of federalism, it's complete lack of any kind of democracy, actually. It's completely top-down. It is the kind of party they're thinking of is one that has a demonstration once a year, a rally once a year, Owen Jones speaks, and then everybody <laughs> goes back home again. That potentially would not be a step forward, but would be a dead end, really, on the road to a genuine party of the working class. But we also have to recognise, most importantly, that the work that we are doing in Tusk now um, is, is about establishing the idea of a new party, popularising the idea of a new party, but it is also about establishing what kind of party. A party that is democratic, is federal, is organised on a clear socialist programme. And what we do in these elections, yes, we want as many votes as we can get, but the most important element of what we have to do is not just to convince people to vote Tusk, but to convince trade unionists in particular to become active in Tusk, to become candidates for Tusk, to become partisans of a new party. And as far as we are able to do that, out of that we can establish a framework, the groundwork, if you like, for a new party that would be a historic step forward for the working class in Britain. Now, just to make a, a, an administrative point here, I'm spending quite a lot of time on Tusk and the elections. We have got a separate session on Tusk and the elections, but the political elements of it need to come into this discussion on Britain. More organisational issues can be dealt with in the Tusk session later, uh, later on today. Now, of course, prior to the foundation of a new party, then we will continue to be in quite a complicated situation where workers are searching for an electoral means to express their anger. In a sense, in the trade union movement, we are in, there's a historical comparison you can make with the period of lib -labism. That was the period when Labour was first beginning to be formed, but the Liberals were still a capitalist party, but the party the trade unions had traditionally supported. And there was the idea, Labour's never going to make it, it's too small, and people wobbled between the established order of the Liberals and the new working class force of Labour. The complications that we will face are not uh, just about workers still looking back towards the Labour Party, which you can see an element of in the RMT. There's all kinds of other issues as well. There is the question of an anti-party mood, which may not be as strong as it was in Spain, in Britain, but it does undoubtedly exist. By the way, it's also been very strong in Ireland, that feeling that they're all the same, they're corrupt and so on. What we're doing in Ireland now shows how we can play a role in changing that mood. No doubt the, the repression from the state that we are now facing in Ireland is a big advantage to us and will lead to a whole layer of workers thinking these people are serious. They're prepared to stand with us and drawing the conclusion that we are a party of, uh, a, party of a different type. Of course, there's also the question, in the absence of a mass workers' party, given the limited strength of Tusk at this stage, that other protest parties can step into the vacuum. There seems even to be a semi-conscious attempt by a section of the capitalist class at the moment 
to promote the Greens as a kind of safe left alternative. In part, of course, that comes from the Tory party, hoping that they can siphon off a few Labour votes by encouraging people to vote Green. But more importantly, it's the fear of a genuine left-wing force like Tusk making a breakthrough in the election. And of course, while internationally, the Greens have been largely discredited in most countries because they've taken part in coalition governments that have implemented savage austerity. In Britain, on a national level, it's different in Brighton, but that's not seen nationally at this stage, they are as yet relatively untainted. And that means their attempt to lean left, to say that they stand for a £10 an hour minimum wage, even if it's not till 2020, the other demands that they've put forward, which are to the left, undoubtedly, of the Labour leadership, that can have a certain effect on a layer of workers. Now, that could be discredited quite quickly. Let's see what happens beyond the general election. They say at the moment that they don't want to join a formal coalition with Labour. Frankly, if they get a chance of a bit of power, I would not at all exclude them changing their mind about that when it comes to it. But at the moment, they say that they would back up a Labour government by voting for its budgets in order to stop worse Tory cuts, uh, 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 cuts uh, budgets. And they say they will do that not just in the short term, but throughout a, a Labour uh, government. Um, and we have to be clear, over time, that will badly damage them. They will be associated with the austerity that Labour would carry out. But in the short term, when the Labour's just been elected, that would not necessarily be the case. So we'll see with the Greens. But for a period of time, even if they are backing up Labour in the Parliament, they will not necessarily immediately uh, be... Uh, discredited. And certainly in the short term, there is no doubt that there will be potential Tusk voters in this election who will be choosing between Tusk and the Greens. And many of them will recognise that Tusk represents an embryo of a voice for the working class and that the Greens don't. The Greens said very clearly in their 2010 election statements that they opposed big business funding for political parties and trade union funding for political parties that had an equally corrupting influence. That's the position of the Greens. They don't stand for the organised working class in any sense at all. But there can be people who recognise that, who agree with us, but still vote Green at this stage because it seems like on a national basis they have a higher profile in opposing austerity and can therefore seem like a more, uh, a more effective left vote. We should be patient with those workers, explain to them and attempt to win them to Tusk. And we have to say that our experience so far is that while the Greens membership has shot up, that is mainly amongst more middle class sections of society, young people to some extent, is less amongst the working class, but also it's primarily passive at this point in time. So they have got a whole layer of students who've joined them. And on the national student demonstration, Caroline Lucas was bet, met with rapturous applause. No wonder she stands for, uh, the, uh, for free education. But there were hardly any, literally hardly any, young Greens on the demonstration. Socialist students were by far the biggest organised force. But even while that's true, and they have a relatively small layer drawn into them actively at this point in time, we should still recognise potentially you can get good forces splitting from the Greens in the future to orientate towards Tusk or a new party of the working class. I don't have time to deal with it, but there's interesting developments taking place in Brighton, not yet in the council chamber. Let's see if it gets to the council chamber. But in meetings of the Greens in Brighton, of their, their branch meeting, a vote that they should set a no-cuts budget, that they should refuse to carry out further cuts, which five councillors voted in favour of it. Now, we have to see if they have the courage of their convictions, but we should take a similar approach to them, to the patient approach that we have taken to that, those handful of Labour councillors who've been prepared to vote against the cuts. Two years ago, those councillors were all in meetings of the Labour left. This year, they were at the Tusk conference. And by the way, as the local authority cuts start to bite into the bone, and they are doing that this April. You know, whole numbers of cities where every Shore Start scheme, every library, every public toilet is threatened with the closure. Labour say they not only won't reverse that,
votes, but inevitably will introduce further cuts the following year, under the huge pressure of that situation, you could see councillors from different parties reaching their limits. You could see a comparison with grief, where reluctantly 20 councils who had implemented vicious austerity for years reached a breaking point and said, we're not prepared to do this anymore. Given their character, extremely unstable, you can't exclude UKIP councillors saying that they're not going to be prepared to carry, uh, to, uh, not being out, not being prepared uh, to carry uh, out cuts. And I do just want to make a few points on UKIP. We all know, of course, that UKIP heralds from the right wing of the Tory party, that its leadership seems to be virtually in interchangeable with a section of the right wing of the Tory party. But as we've discussed previously, a big part of their vote comes from people looking for an effective means to protest against the establishment. It was summed up, there was an article in The Economist this week, which was actually about the very good demonstration that our comrades <coughs> organised outside uh, the UKIP office when, a, when a Farage was visiting uh, in Yorkshire. But they interviewed various passers-by, quite a lot of whom were supporting UKIP, rather than the demonstration. But I thought this one in particular, I'm quoting, so I apologise for the language, summed up the attitude of a section of the working class, because he said, I don't like Farage, he's a tit, and he's talking out of his ass. <laughs> <laughs> but then said, but I'm voting for him. <laughs> and that is not untypical. The idea, we know he's an idiot, but it's a means to kick the establishment, and therefore we're going to vote for them in the election. And the same article described how in a whole number of Labour heartlands, South Shields, Barnsley Central, Middlesbrough, UKIP have already come second in recent elections, and their central election strategy, the reason they're putting so much time into the north rather than into places in the south where they're actually more likely to win victories, is because they're aiming to come second in 50 Labour seats in the general election with the view that you will then have an unpopular Labour government and they will be able to sweep up in the course of, uh, in the, course of the next parliament. And when you look at the view of UKIP voters, the majority of them are to the left, not just of the leadership of UKIP, but of all of the establishment parties. 78% of them support renationalisation of the energy companies. 73% renationalisation of the railways. You could give a whole list of issues where they stand, uh, in, uh, stand to the left of the main parties. Now, of course, UKIP are also gaining votes by playing on workers' fears on immigration. They play a pernicious role in whipping up racism, and that is then echoed by the Tories and also by Labour, whose only answer is to put forward exactly the same divisive anti-migrant policies. But it's interesting, because of their attempt to appeal to the working class, even on the issue of immigration, UKIP put things sometimes in a very distorted class position. I nearly fell off my chair. I was listening to Radio 4 a few weeks ago, and there was someone on there who it turned out was from UKIP, but I didn't realise that because I'd come in at, you know, after he'd started speaking, um, who was asked about immigration and answered by quoting Tony Benn. And he said, Tony Benn always said that a socialist Britain would not be a Britain where there was a race to the bottom over wages. That's not the kind of country I want to live in, and that's why I oppose for uh, open, open borders for this country. So even on immigration, they were attempting in a distorted way to pose things in class terms. Now, we only deal with this question of immigration very briefly in this year's perspectives document. We've dealt with it at much more length in previous perspectives documents. And I don't have the time now to repeat the points that have been made in previous discussions. But it remains an issue for us of vital importance and actually potentially of even more importance under the next government than it has been in the last uh, period. And as was shown by the Tusk Conference, it's an issue that we have to take up and debate and discuss in the movement as well. Now, how important the issue of immigration is in workers' minds varies. It's not static. Um, broadly speaking, you can say that when there is united class struggle against the capitalist class, and immigration recedes. It's a less important issue in the minds of workers. But in periods of low-class struggle, when it's being whipped up by the right-wing media and the capitalist parties, then it comes more to the fore. But it's
pretty consistent that opinion polls show that over 80% of people in Britain think immigration is currently too high to Britain. Now, of course, that largely reflects the racist propaganda of the right-wing media and the capitalist politicians, falsely claiming that it is immigration that is responsible for austerity, cuts in public services, and so on. But we shouldn't be too simplistic. It's not only that. It also relates to how it, that propaganda chimes with workers' own experience. In the sense that under the last Labour government, over four years, one million workers, overwhelmingly from Eastern Europe, arrived in Britain. And in net terms, that was the biggest immigration that has taken place in the modern history of Britain. And that was a conscious policy by a big section of the capitalist class who wanted to use super-exploited migrant workers as a means to drive down wages. But it means, for example, if you look at the Newark by-election, which was one of the first ones that people thought UKIP might win. They didn't win it in the end. But in that by-election, there were articles reporting that the two biggest employers in Newark, a, biscuit, a, a cake factory and a Dixon's warehouse, which says something about the character of jobs uh, in Britain, both employed a majority of workers from Eastern Europe. Most of them were employed by agencies. Mostly the jobs were not advertised in Britain, but only advertised in the countries of Eastern Europe. And those agency workers were not paid the proper rate for the job that the full-time permanent staff were paid. So it's inevitable in that situation, given the lack of a fight back from the trade union movement on the issue, that you get an anti-immigrant mood developing in that constituency. Our job is to lay the blame for the crisis where it belongs, with the bosses and capitalism, not with the workers and poor from other countries. And that we have to patiently explain to workers in Europe, the only way you'll stop the bosses driving down wages is to convince those Eastern European workers to join the union and to fight for them to be full-time permanent staff who get the right for the job. In other words, only class unity can overcome the attempts of the bosses to fight for us. At the same time, of course, we have to, and we do, trenchantly defend the rights of migrants, stand for the right to asylum, support anti-deportation campaigns, fight for the right to the job, the right to claim benefit for migrant workers, and so on. But if we want to convince workers of our programme, then we have to be able to engage in a conversation with them, a dialogue. And in our view, this is the issue that came up at the Tusk conference. If we were to just have in our list of demands, a demand for opposition to all immigration controls, for open borders, we would not be able to get into a conversation, at least with that 80% of people who think that immigration is too high, but actually probably with 99% of workers, including those whose own parents and grandparents were migrants, because they feel it's just utopian, it's not possible, you can't do that. Of course, that doesn't mean that we don't explain that a socialist world would be a world without borders, but it's not sim possible to simply put it forward in a crude slogan. Better to use a slogan of opposition to racist immigration controls, which at least allows you to then enter into a discussion of the racist character of immigration controls under capitalism. And we have to recognise, to go back to UKIP, that there are a section of workers who are currently voting for UKIP who can be won to Tusk or to a mass workers' party in the future. Come to that, some of them can be won to our ranks, to the ranks of the Socialist Party. UKIP is inherently, incredibly unstable. The gap between its leadership, who want to privatise the National Health Service, and the people who are voting for it, who support renationalisation of the privatised utilities, is huge. And therefore, it can split in all kinds of directions. But we should also recognise, given the vacuum that exists against all the odds, with all its contradictions, it can continue to exist and to make gains for a period of time. In our view, it's not possible to judge how many seats the protest parties, to put it broadly, will gain in the general election. You can't say UKIP and the Greens actually could gain relatively few, perhaps not even any, other than what they've already got in this general election. But what we can say is they'll get significant votes, but also that the next government, however weak this government is, the next government beyond May will make this Condem coalition look all-powerful. Because we are heading towards an extremely weak and unstable coalition or minority government. And that will mark the start of an important new phase of the
class struggle in Britain. We are likely to be facing a new uh, phase of the economic crisis, both internationally and in Britain. How long have we had? 20 minutes. Put it there. Thank you. Just in case any of you were under any illusion that the dramatic fall in oil prices is opening up the prospect of a recovery in the world economy or the British economy, Christine Lagarde, the director of the IMF, is on hand to smash your hopes. Where she said very clearly, cheaper oil and growth in the US is not enough to pull the global economy out of a growth pattern that is too low, too brittle, and too lopsided, and has deep-seated weaknesses that are not going to be overcome in the, near or, uh, in the near future or the medium term. Of course, in Britain, as in many other advanced capitalist countries, the fall in the price of oil does result in cheaper petrol, might result in slightly cheaper food, and therefore a certain limited easing on the strain in workers' pockets, but it is not compensation for the misery they're continuing to face. And on the other side, the British oil industry still employs 450,000 people, particularly in Scotland, obviously. Um, it still puts a lot of taxes into the exchequer. And so on the other side, it also is a deepening of the crisis for the British economy. Despite the vast sums pumped into the UK economy via quantitative easing. It's the equivalent to £24,000 per British family. And in addition to that, the lowest interest rates for over 300 years, growth in Britain remains extremely low. What growth has taken place has largely been by, by the re-inflating of the credit bubbles and now seems to be slowing down again. And they're worried about it. If you look at Carney's announcements, the Governor of the Bank of England, the fact that he's saying that they're facing deflation in the British economy, but also preparing the ground for further refueling of the punch bowl to try and keep the show on the road, saying that they may have to go for a new round of QE, that they may have to lower interest rates even below their 300-year low, effectively to negative interest rates, is an indication that they're worried by what, worried by what is coming. So that the next government will be very weak and will be facing, in all likelihood, a new stage of the economic crisis. It's clear that the preference of the majority of the capitalist class would be for a Tory-led government to deal with that situation. And that's shown by the vast sums of money that are being pumped into the Tory party at the moment. Enough for them to fight two elections, if necessary, as they may have to do. They've had more than five million pounds of donor donations from donors with accounts at the HSBC's now infamous Swiss private bank account uh, bank, uh, alone. Now, it does partly reflect the dysfunctional character of British capitalism, the complete dominance of the finance sector. 72% of stock market trading on the British uh, stock markets is now done by hedge funds and their ilk. They dominate British capitalism and they pay the money to the British Tory party. But it also reflects that while they want the Tory party in power, the Tory party does not accurately act in the interests of the collective uh, the capitalist class in Britain in the way that it would have done in the past. And let's be clear, there is a fear in the trade union movement, and this includes amongst leading figures in the trade unions on the left, that the most likely outcome of the general election will be a strong Tory government or perhaps a strong Tory UKIP coalition. That is ruled out. If they have, if the Tories are forced to enter a coalition with UKIP, and it's much more likely they would have UKIP propping them up from outside, that would be a sign of the extreme weakness of British capitalism and the very crisis-ridden character of the period that we're going into. If the Tories manage to come out of the elections as the biggest party, then if they manage to form a government, they can be faced with splits virtually immediately. Because of the hatred of the Lib Dems amongst Tory backbenchers, Cameron has been forced to give uh, the, Tory, uh, the Tories a promise that they will have a vote as back the backbenchers, the MPs, on the formation of a new coalition. Given the headbanger character of the Tory backbenchers, that will create an immediate and very real problem for Cameron in forming any kind of coalition government. In order to try and cut across UKIP, Cameron and the others and the Tory party leadership have hinted they might bring a referendum on the European Union forward in the next parliament. UKIP have said that that is a condition, 
are then propping up a Tory government. It's an immediate disaster for them. There's no doubt that Cameron would want to argue to stay within the European Union and that that is the position of the majority of the capitalist class in Britain. But you can't just whip people up over a whole period of time and then put them back in their box uh, once you want to carry through an a policy in the interests of, uh, of the capitalist class. You could see a very rapid split in the Tory party on the question of the, of the EU. And by the way, there are similar processes in a whole number of European countries that mean that you could see the EU, at least in its current form, ceasing to exist in, in the next period. So of course it's true that a Tory minority government would attempt to go on the offensive against the working class, but it would do so from a position of extreme weakness. By the way, we say in the document about how a Tory minority government could go on the attack on some social issues, on, for example, on the question of women. And that's undoubtedly true. They could try and launch an attack on abortion rights, limiting them further, and so on. But there are real limits to how far they will be able to go on that. It is now embedded into the fabric of British capitalism that women are in the workplace. Families can't afford to survive on the basis of women staying at home. But that gives confidence to working class women, and it is not about to be undone. You can see in the recent events that have taken place that on the one hand, women are suffering sexism, domestic violence, all the other issues remain. There's a certain offensive against women in the media and so on. But at the same time, women are more confident than they would have been in the past to take that up primarily because uh, at root because of the role that they play today in the workplace. And that means any attack on women, for example, on abortion rights, would lead to an uprising amongst women in Britain, and they would be forced back in a similar way to they have been in Spain, for example. But the essential attack on the, would be on the working class, and in particular, on the rights of the trade unions to organise. The nightmare that the PCS are currently battling against, that is a foretaste of what a Tory minority government would attempt to do. But they would be overreaching themselves. The question of a 24-hour general strike has waxed and waned. It's been here throughout uh, this, uh, go this government, but it has been of more or less prominence at different times. A new Tory minority government attacking the trade unions, it will be put centre stage immediately, actually on a higher level than it's been at any point during the current government. There is a certain comparison here with what has taken place in Belgium, where at the end of the last year there was a mighty first regional and then national general strike, and it shows what the trade union leaders can do when they lift their little fingers, because they actually called a general strike and they organised for it. And you saw the re-establishment of mass workplace meetings, voting on walking out, mass picket lines, a really powerful movement that took place. Part of the reason for it was the scale of the attacks that the working class faced, but it was also the attacks on the trade union's right to organise, which affected even the trade union bureaucrats. And you can see an element in the, of that in the attacks that the Tories, if they were won the election, would try to carry out against the working class. Of course, and this shows the reactionary character of individual terrorism, the trade union leaders in Belgium were terrified by the scale of the movement they'd unleashed, more frightened even than the capitalists and have been able to use the terror attacks that have taken place in France and Belgium as an excuse to try uh, and derail that movement. By the way, there's no time to deal with it, but here too, we have to be prepared for the possibility of terrorist attacks and for us to demand a movement of the working class, of the trade unions, against terrorism, against war, against racism, in the same way as we did after the 7-7 bombers. It's probably more likely, however, that we will have a Labour led government. And that would also be an extremely weak government. And while it would not carry out every single policy in exactly the same way as the Tories, they might at least in the first instance soft pedal on some of the attacks on the trade unions. In essence, they would carry out the same policies because that is what is demanded by British capitalism. It would be completely different to the Labour governments of the 1990s and the noughties, not because of the character of Miliband primarily, 
but because of the situation in which it came to power and the profound crisis of British capitalism. And that is why the new statesmen have caught up. We've warned about Labour going the way of PASOK over years now, and that would now be posed, uh, would, uh, would now be posed if Labour are the biggest party beyond the, uh, beyond the election. There will be light to preside over a new crisis in the British economy. Again, it would probably start in the financial sector. So having been blamed once for what took place in 2007, 2008, they would now be blamed again for the next stage of the economic crisis at the same time, of course, as they would attempt to carry out vicious austerity. <coughs> Labour would quite like a coalition with the Liberals. The problem they've got with that is the Liberals are on 6% in the opinion polls. So, you know, it may not be a very practical solution. And, of course, it's not without difficulties for them. There's, the people who would be, uh, there's a lot of people angry with the Liberals, so they wouldn't be a very effective prop with which, for which to blame for the policies that were carried out. But it's probably more likely that they would have, end up either propped up from outside or even in a formal coalition with the SNP. Populists have tried to work out all the different scenarios and they think it's 42% that the SNP will be in the next government in some form or other, well, rather than the me trying to work that out. But the point is, it's already clear in the pre-election propaganda how a coalition with the SNP, the SNP will be making demands for Devo Max in Scotland, but they would also be posturing about how they're against austerity, and it's Labour's fault that austerity is being carried out. It will be a disaster, an extremely unstable uh, situation for Labour, but also uh, 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 for the capitalist class uh, as a whole. So, such is the weakness of all of the governmental options beyond the general election, that the capitalist class have started discussing whether they should go for a grand coalition, some kind of national government. Now, as we make the point in the documents, that is a general trend for the capitalist class. Their inability to govern means they have to cobble together all the capitalist parties in order to make a semi-stable government. But in Britain, the capitalists will hesitate again and again. They will only go for a coalition involving Labour and the Tories, the two big parties, when they really have no other options left. Because Labour being in a coalition with others that would not be seen by the working class as a betrayal in the way it would have been in the past. Peter made this point earlier. Tories is a different kettle of fish. You go into coalition with the Tories when the whole point of Labour amongst the workers who vote for them is to stop the Tories getting in. That is seen very differently. And what it means from the point of view of the capitalist class is they've got no second 11. There's no other team to step into the vacuum and a huge gap is left for the development of a mass workers' party based on the trade unions in Britain. So they will try to avoid it, but you can't absolutely exclude them having no choice. And certainly what can happen is a Swedish scenario where the outcome of the election is so unclear, but they don't dare go for another general election immediately because they don't think it will be any clearer. And therefore, all the parties prop up the one that has the most votes in power in order to delay a general election. What can you say with certainty? You can say with certainty that the British capitalist class are losing their ability to govern, govern and lack clear or powerful instruments through which they can govern. And that therefore, the capitalist class in Britain will face a crisis-ridden situation beyond the general election. I've had no time to deal with the possibility of the child abuse scandal exploding. I mean, what does it say about the British establishment that they have to go to New Zealand to find somebody who can actually chair this inquiry? So discredited are the actual British uh, establishment. But that can explode. The question of foreign policy. There's a whole number of different issues on which the next government will face crisis. Meanwhile, the working class who entered this era of economic crisis profoundly unprepared for the onslaught that they were going to face with a low level of organisation, the absence of a mass party, a lack of understanding amongst the mass about the possibility of a different society of socialism. And yet, despite all of those hindrances, has shown again and again that if a lead is given, they are prepared to fight. And we have to recognise in Britain as well, on the basis of the bitter experience of the struggles that the working class has been through and our intervention, lessons are being learnt for the future. They will not all be learnt in one fell swoop by the whole working class. It will take place at different stages amongst different sections of workers. 
but it can also take sudden leaps forward. Amongst a section of young people, you can see that and the current call for revolution by Russell Brand. However confused it is by him, it represents a generation of young people who think this system doesn't work, we need something fundamentally different. We will also see amongst young people and the unorganised in general at a certain stage, the conclusion being drawn as it's begun to be in the US that the only way we can fight for our rights in the workplace is to get organised, particularly around the issue of £10 an hour and the prospect of a kind of new unionism struggle of a new generation entering the trade union movement can be posed in the next period, but also the question of the development of a new party. And Podemos, whatever its complications, shows how quickly that can erupt once people have drawn the conclusion that they need a political expression for their struggle if they're to succeed. And most importantly, from our point of view, the ideas of socialism. For us, events in Greece are enormously important because they've shown people that it's possible to win elections on an anti-austerity programme, but also because people are seeing, played out concretely in action, a discussion on what is necessary to successfully implement anti-austerity. And our socialist programme, the need to nationalise the commanding heights of the economy, the need for a socialist plan, is posed much more concretely than it has been by many, for many years by the events that are taking place. This conference is primarily to prepare us for the elections. We want to do all we can to popularise Tusk and the need for an electoral alternative. But we have to make sure we don't leave it at that. We are preparing for big breaks when it will be possible to win thousands, tens of thousands of people to us, to the Socialist Party, to a revolutionary party. But we're doing the preparation for that now. And even in this election campaign, alongside canvassing, giving out leaflets, we have to find those people who are prepared to join us in the struggle for socialism and recruit them to our ranks. Thank you.